Welcome, welcome this morning to uh, Blackburn Presbyterian Church. Uh, let's seek to uh, have fellowship uh, together uh, despite having to use electronic means. Uh, I'll commit our time to the Lord. Gracious God and Father, we thank you that you are the God who sent Jesus Christ into this world to suffer and die on our behalf. As we meet in his name, we pray that his blood will cover all our faults and sins. We pray that the spirit of Jesus will fill us and make us very conscious of our connection to you and to others. Bless us in the reading and the preaching of your word. And we pray this in our Saviour's name. Amen. First of all, we will uh, hear from God's word, a reading from Psalm 94 and then a reading from Mark chapter 8. The first reading is from Psalm 94, reading from verses 1 to 15. O Lord, thou God of vengeance, thou God of vengeance, shine forth. Rise up, O judge of the earth, render to the proud their deserts. O Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked exult? They pour out their arrogant words, they boast, all the evildoers. They crush thy people, O Lord, and afflict thy heritage. They slay the widow and the sojourner, and murder the fatherless. And they say, the Lord does not see, the God of Jacob does not perceive. Understand, O dullest of the people. Fools, when will you be wise? He who planted the ear, does he not hear? He who formed the eye, does he not see? He who chastens the nations, does he not chastise? He who teaches men knowledge, the Lord knows the thoughts of man that they are but a breath. Blessed is the man whom thou dost chasten, O Lord, and whom thou dost teach out of thy law, to give him respite from days of trouble, until a pit is dug for the wicked. For the Lord will not forsake his people, he will not abandon his heritage. For justice will return to the righteous, and all the upright in heart will follow it. And reading from the New Testament, Mark, uh, Mark chapter 8, beginning at verse 27. Mark chapter 8, beginning at verse 27. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea and Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are not on the side of God, but of men. And he called to him the multitude with his disciples and said to them, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? 
For what can a man give in return for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in the adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Now, as I uh, speak about those readings this morning, what I want to do is to, uh, in a sense, review the whole of the Gospel of Mark. In other words, uh, in just one sermon, uh, let's try to work out together uh, what this Gospel is about and why Mark, the evangelist, may have written it. Now, how do you review a book? Uh, there's more than one method. Uh, a good way is to look at the opening chapter and the closing chapter uh, because often authors uh, in those key chapters uh, either introduce uh, the main things they want to say or at the end of the book they, they sum up uh, the main point that has been made. And we can do that with the Gospel of Mark but uh, this morning I want to do it slightly differently I want to look with you at what we could call the vital turning point in the book, the, the hinge on which the whole book turns. And that turning point uh, happens to be basically halfway through this Gospel of Mark. So we're going to look at the last two paragraphs of chapter 8, chapter 8 out of 16 chapters. I want to suggest that this passage basically divides the Gospel of Mark into its two main parts. The first eight chapters lead up to this key section. And then the second half of the Gospel, chapters 9 to 16, are building on what Jesus does here. So if we can understand these few verses, what I'm suggesting is we'll really understand the essential purpose and message of Mark's Gospel. Now, why am I looking at Mark's gospel? Well, in, in some way, it's a good gospel to begin with because we think, the theory goes, that this is the first of the gospels to be written. So we're thinking of uh, perhaps the year 65 AD, uh, a gospel written by Mark to Christians in Rome where they are beginning to experience persecution, severe persecution, and that really has shaped his presentation of the life and message of Jesus. So let's look at these verses together. Beginning uh, chapter 8 and verse 27, let me read that verse to you. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? Caesarea Philippi is not a big place. It's a fairly isolated situation in the far north of Palestine, some 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. In other words, uh, well to the north of the usual area where Jesus moved in his ministry. Uh, he wants to get away from the crowds. He has the 12 disciples with him. He wants to question them in private without fear of interruption. And the question that Jesus asks is not a difficult one because uh, he asks for a survey of public opinion about him. What do people, or who do people say that I am? And the disciples have a ready answer in verse 28. They told him, John the Baptist. Others say, Elijah. And, and or others, one of the prophets. So here are the ideas. In other words, uh, people generally are placing Jesus in the category of prophet. Now the same uh, survey or range of opinions is sounded a little earlier in Mark's Gospel. We see very similar things said in chapter 6 from verse 14. King Herod, in this case, has heard about Jesus. Who is this person? And again, the same kind of possibilities. Is it John the baptizer raised from the dead? Is it Elijah? Or is he a prophet like one of the prophets of old? So we're thinking in the category of prophet. And indeed, in the intervening chapters, chapters 6 to 8, when we look at the kind of things Jesus has been doing, his works of power, they do particularly remind us of 
things that have been seen before in the ministry of Elijah and Elisha. Miraculous feedings, healings, resurrections, uh, crossing bodies of water. So, so uh, public opinion is not without reason placing him in this category of prophet. So that their opinions have been can are canvassed. Here are the results. But then Jesus asks a more challenging question, a question where the disciples themselves have to declare what they think. Verse 29, and he asked them, but who do you say that I am? So Jesus is putting them on the spot. What about you? What do you think? Uh, who do you think uh, that I am? And, and Peter, uh, when he speaks up, he doesn't just echo public opinion, but goes well beyond it. And it's clear enough that Peter is uh, speaking on, be, uh, on behalf of the disciples. Remember in the Gospel of Mark, often uh, Peter's the one who pipes up and says stuff, uh, expressing his own thoughts, but also the thoughts uh, of the other disciples. He's a leader among them. And so it's Peter, of course, who uh, speaks out. Verse 29, uh, um, Peter answered, you are the Christ. Now, of course, this is a very famous statement uh, in the Gospels. Uh, Jesus did have a powerful ministry that reminded us of the Old Testament prophets. And Elijah and John the Baptist are two of the greatest of the prophets. And in some sense, it is no insult to put Jesus in the same category. But Peter recognises that Jesus is greater still. In fact, he is the unique member of a totally different category. And Peter declares that he is the Christ. Now, is that what you think about Jesus? How would you have answered that question. Now, now, obviously, Peter here is a model. This is the, this is the answer that we're all uh, meant to make. Uh, you are the Christ. And so here's a title that fits Jesus. He's the Christ. But what does it mean to declare that Jesus is the Christ? And that's the key point. The rest of Mark's Gospel, the second half of the Gospel, chapters 9 to 16 are written to teach us who exactly, or what exactly do we mean, or, or should we mean, when we acknowledge Jesus as the Christ. In other words, can I put it like this, what kind of Christ is Christ? Peter gives the right answer, but does he have the right content? Does he really understand uh, what he is saying? What kind of Christ will Jesus be? Well, the uh, shock value in the Gospel of Mark, and particularly in this passage, is that Jesus is not the kind of Christ that we think or maybe even want. When we call Jesus the Christ, uh, it's talking about the fact that he is anointed. And we're meant to think especially of the Old Testament kings who were anointed, consecrated, and have a, had a very important role within the nation in the purposes of God. So Jesus is the coming king that all the Old Testament anticipates, expects, and is looking forward to. Uh, but what kind of Christ, what kind of king is Jesus when he comes? Well, not the one that people think. And that really is the explanation for what Jesus goes on to immediately do. Uh, and so in verse 29, Peter has said, you are the Christ. Verse 30 and he charged them to tell no one about him. Uh, the command for silence. Jesus prevents his disciples openly proclaiming that he is the Christ, the Messiah. That's another way we could express it. Uh, there's a ban on proclaiming this until after his death and resurrection. Because until Jesus dies and is raised, uh, here is a title, here is a claim that will be easily misunderstood. Uh, P Peter's got the right word, Christ, but he hasn't got the, the right conception of Christ. Uh, it's the same title that's given to Jesus at the very opening of the gospel. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So Peter's got the right answer, 
but he really has no conception of what it means to acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ. And the rest of the gospel is going to uh, unpack this. In other words, I'm talking about the importance of definitions. Now let me just say something a little bit about ministers and those who proclaim the message, the importance of definitions. Uh, you're not likely to go to any church that doesn't mention the words God, Christ, cross and faith. But what exactly is the meaning that is being given to these words, the importance of definitions? And then if we think of, of Christian people generally, what is a Christian? A Christian is a follower of Christ. That's what it means. But again, yes, but, but what kind of Christ are we following? The importance of definitions, whether we're those who are proclaiming the message and we're all meant to be in some way spreading the message, but also the importance of definitions. Uh, who exactly is the Jesus that we are following? Now we need to think about that very carefully because we're living in a moment in history where we live in a, a very self-indulgent society uh, the city of Melbourne, with its kind of lifestyle uh, focus and interest, uh, are we in danger of fashioning a Christ of our own and not the serving, suffering Christ that Mark is presenting to us in this gospel? So yes, the right answer, you are the Christ, but what sort of of Christ. Well, that's what Jesus goes on to explain. Verse 31, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. That was not the kind of Christ that Peter had in mind. But that is the true Jesus Christ that is presented to us in Mark and in all the Gospels and indeed the Bible as a whole. Our conception of Christianity has at its, must have at its centre a suffering Christ. So Peter uses the right words but he misunderstands the import of his words. And that's clear enough because as, as soon as Jesus begins to unpack, well what I mean by Christ, verse 31, and he's talking about rejection and suffering and death and resurrection, uh, Peter wants to contradict him. Uh, verse 32, he, Jesus, said this plainly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. So Jesus, uh, P Peter tries to contradict what Jesus is saying. But as Jesus begins to talk about what kind of Christ the Son of Man must suffer, uh, that Son of Man title is Jesus his preferred way of talking about himself, we won't go into details of what all of that might mean, but certainly the Son of Man title includes the idea of humanity that could suffer. Jesus tells his disciples that he is a suffering Messiah. That for Peter is an impossible contradiction. Peter has to review and reform his ideas of what it means for Jesus to be the Christ and maybe we do too. Notice that Jesus says the Son of Man must suffer. Uh, it's God's will. It's spoken about in prophecy, Isaiah 53, a leading example. It's the divinely appointed way for Jesus to save humanity, a suffering Christ. And before we're too hard on Peter... Uh, it's not only Peter who has trouble accepting the words of Jesus here. All human ideas of grandeur and glory were crucified with Jesus on the cross. In other words, we not only need to look at Jesus differently, but as a result, uh, we need to look at the world differently. Our hope that we can do good without having to suffer is shattered by the words of Jesus here. Now the disciples are struggling with what Jesus says. Notice that, as I mentioned, 
the wording is, he began to teach them. He begins here and he'll try again and again to get this message through. The Son of Man must suffer, he'll be rejected, he'll be killed after three days rise. There's very similar verses saying the same thing put on the lips of Jesus in chapters 9 and 10 uh, of this gospel as well. He's speaking as directly and as plainly and as he can, and yet the disciples stumble over these words. But this is who Jesus is. This is the real Christ, the Christ who came to suffer and to die, the Christ who experienced rejection. And this view of Christ and then a, 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 a Christianity with the cross at its centre, well, this is the only Christianity that there really is. Uh, this contradicts what sometimes we, we want to have, a, a Christianity that doesn't ask too much, a Christianity that helps me through the day, a, a Christianity that always has me smiling uh, and, and in a good mood. Well, that's not the Christianity that we find in uh, the Gospel of Mark. It's a Christianity with the sleeves rolled up. It's a Christianity which is facing uh, challenges. It's a Christianity that uh, experiences rejection and in which there is suffering. The grace of God is free, but it's not cheap. That's the way the German theologian martyr Dietrich Bonhoeffer expresses it. We, we can't have a Christianity with all the benefits but none of the costs. That kind of Christianity is impossible when we look at what Jesus says here. The, a Christ who suffers. And so playing down the cross, uh, not having the cross at the centre of what the Christian faith is, uh, that's not just unfortunate human thinking, but that's a satanic attack on real Christianity, which is what Jesus, in effect, says here. When Peter rebukes him, verse 32, but turning and seeing his disciples, he, Jesus, rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not on the side of men, but of God. A passage like this tells us that we can't just have a convenient Christianity. In other words, we can have Christ, but then merrily go on our customary way of living. No, uh, the Christianity of the Gospel of Mark is, is a, a, a faith uh, where we will uh, inevitably uh, suffer and have severe challenges placed upon us because we're following the one who went all the way to the cross. And it's not up to us then to you know, look around at the different churches and to be you know, making judgments of other people. The main challenge is, is ourselves, isn't it? Because we, we all would like a, a comfortable and convenient form of Christianity. But let's look at what our passage says. We acknowledge we're following Jesus is the Christ. What kind of Christ is? He is here, one who went to suffer and, and to die. Now, when Jesus says things like this and he makes explicit the uh, challenge uh, of, uh, to his followers, verse 34, he called to, to him the multitude with his disciples and he said to them, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself Take up his cross and follow me. Jesus laying down the conditions of his disciples. Uh, did he expect to get any takers? How many people did he think was, were going to enlist when this is the invitation? Remember near the beginning of the gospel, he invites disciples to follow him. Well, now they begin to discover what that really means. They must follow him all the way to the cross. Notice the expression Jesus uses, that they are to come after him. He is going to the cross. Uh, we, like him, must bear a cross. 
Are, are, are we willing? It's plain from the wording that Jesus is not just thinking of the exclusive group of the twelve, his immediate followers, uh, the privileged twelve. Of course, yes, they will suffer. Uh, they will face rejection. But Jesus is speaking more widely than that. Uh, our passage, verse 34, specifically says that he called the crowd to him with the disciples. This is not just for an inner group. We're not here talking about a, a higher form of Christianity that maybe ministers and missionaries are expected to live and the rest of us can just kind of look on and watch them uh, doing heroic things. No, notice the actual wording, if, if anyone would come after me. In other words, Jesus is talking about anyone and everyone who what, wants to follow him. Jesus is going to the cross. Uh, the Christian life is going to include a thousand crosses and all very rugged. Well, who would want to follow Jesus? Why, why would anyone uh, do this? What possibly could the motivation be? Well, who, who is inviting us to follow him? It's the Christ who loved us enough to die for us. Remember how the Apostle Paul speaks in the second letter to the Corinthians chapter 5, the love of Christ controls us. It's not our love for Christ. No, the love of Christ, there is Christ's love for us, controls us, has mastered us. Us knowing that Christ loved us enough to die for us, we want to follow and we're willing to pay the cost uh, that's involved. Something similar in Romans chapter 5. Remember how Jesus says that one may perhaps die for a good man. The good man, in other words, the, the, the person who's done good to us, our benefactor. Jesus Christ is our ultimate benefactor. That's why I and millions of other people have decided to follow Jesus and God enabling we want to pay that cost if there's rejection we're willing to try to face that if there's suffering that's God enabling that's not going to uh, allow us to turn to one side uh, who else has loved us enough to die for us and so the love of Christ Christ's love for us controls us has mastered us I gather that that's why Jesus, despite these challenging words, take up your cross and follow, him, follow me, he expected that there were some who would take up that challenge. As well as that, is it not true that the selfish life is a misspent and wasted life? Even the world in its better moments knows this. There are many examples, but... Out of a whole crowd, what about uh, Dr. Fred Hollows? He'd been Australian of the Year, his eye clinics in East Africa and so forth. Uh, the Fred Hollows Institute, it's still a, a well-known and uh, popular charity. Uh, even the people of the world admire such people. And we know that we should be like them. And the church has more than its fair share of such selfless heroes and martyrs. He loved us enough to die for us. Why did he go to the cross? To, to bear our sin, to pay our debt to God. What should we not be willing now to do for Jesus? And so this, of course, is the ultimately challenging uh, message. Uh, the Son of Man is going to re be rejected and suffer and die, and if we're the followers of the Son of Man, we should expect something of the same. And yet at the centre of this surely is, yes, the, why did he go? For what purpose? The motivation of love, uh, the essential purpose of, of being a ransom for us, to pay our debt, to bring us back to God. That, that's the great motivation that stands behind the challenging words of Jesus. So this Gospel of Mark, I'm suggesting this is the main thing that Mark wants to tell us in his whole Gospel. The first half of the Gospel shows us 
the miracles of Jesus. He is the Christ. The second half of the gospel shows us, yes, but what kind of Christ? The Christ who went to the cross. This has got to shape our view of the Christian faith and it's got to shape our view of the Christian life as well. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. God our Father, we thank and praise you for your Son and our Saviour, Jesus Christ our Lord, the Son of Man who came to seek and to save the lost, the one who came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, the one who loved us enough to die for us, the one who went all the way to the cross for us, the friend of sinners. Father God, we confess that it was our sins as well as the sins of others that required such a drastic remedy. And we acknowledge that we still fall and fail and add to the sufferings of Christ. But we hate the sins that led to Christ's death and we repent and turn from them. Thank you for the sure promise of forgiveness in his name. Please, dear God, make us more like our loving Saviour and like Christ-like believers who inspire us. Purify your church, starting with us, as we recommit ourselves to you and to serving you in this needy world. And for that world we pray. We pray for those who do not realise that their great need is for Christ. We pray for the leaders of the nations of the world and particularly for those who lead our own nation, that they may know that their authority is one which is delegated by you. We pray for our Premier that he will return to health and full strength and that he may know that he has been touched by your mercy. We pray for our health workers and health planners. We ask for an efficient and fair rollout of the vaccination program, not forgetting the homeless, the aged and those with disabilities. Bring peace to this troubled world. We pray for a fair sharing of the wealth of the nations. We pray for the spread of the gospel message of the love and saving grace of God in Jesus Christ, his Son. We pray for missionaries, ministers and all forms of Christian outreach and witness. We pray for our own Pastor Graham, that he would make a full physical recovery. We thank you for the elders of our church and all who serve within this company of God's people. We thank you and we pray for the brothers and sisters in Christ that we regularly fellowship with. Make us all willing to carry our cross. Whatever that burden may be, not wishing that we had some other burden or maybe even a lighter burden, but that we might be faithful under the burdens that you in your wisdom have placed upon us. Help us to step up to the challenges and the opportunities placed before us in this coming week. Hear our prayers, for we pray in the strong name of Jesus, your Son. Amen. Well, thank you for this time that we've been able to have together. And, uh, of course, we're looking forward to uh, very soon uh, being together in this building and being able to uh, share and have fellowship as we normally do. God bless you all.